Welcome to the Scott and Holman podcast. Less than 48 hours later, I think all of our respective heartbeats have finally started to calm down after the uh, the round of 32 game between your Houston Cougar men's basketball team and the Texas A&M Aggies. We're going to talk about that tonight. We're going to talk about a significantly less stressful first round Cougar win. And uh, we're each going to talk about our uh, our respective uh, show and tell Cougar sports that are not men's basketball, though obviously and naturally men's basketball is the main topic of the show. It is the big thing that's been happening uh, in the world of Houston Cougar athletics. Dustin, how did, you know, how did you survive that game? Like I, I full disclosure, you know, I don't have an upstairs neighbor, uh, which did wasn't great when my, when the upstairs neighbor's water heater broke into our living room, but was great because I knew someone wasn't hearing me scream. no, repeatedly and how can you call that and also i think on the on our other side is another kind of vacation rental situation how did you, how did you keep uh your neighbors from ha- getting permanent judgments of you after just the emotional roller coaster that was the night's game and just how are you doing generally buddy it's been a while since we've uh, talked in this specific format yeah man doing pretty well missed the last couple episodes with uh for various reasons um but no got to be back talking to you guys glad to have uh, a houston men's basketball season that is still going to be talking about uh, but how did I handle it? Um, <laughs> my fiance and I just like grabbing each other with like a death grip for most of the game uh, is the answer to that lots of cussing at uh, the referees and whatnot. Good thing. Luckily, we uh, we do rent a house. So uh, do not have and it's, I really only have a neighbor in one direction. And, you know, if they had really. That's said, right. Yeah, we would have tried to keep it down. But um, but but fortunately, uh, that they didn't. Uh, we So we got to just kind of yell at the uh, the television screen together and uh, and luckily hold on and and yeah and, and, man I don't I don't know if I've ever gone through a cougar sporting event where I felt like I was going to throw up as much as I did uh, for much of the second half and overtime of that one but glad to, <laughs> glad that we can all uh, laugh because it ended uh, ended with the cougar w yeah no doubt bobby had such a hard time with it he is uh, he has dropped off the zoom call he he just cannot handle uh, the thought of talking about uh, Houston Cougars and Texas Am. I, I will. I will also say, like near the end of the overtime. To be clear, I, I did end up watching it, but I sent him in. A, oh my god, I don't think I can watch this. Uh, with a when there was, I think it was about the thirty second mark or something like that in the second half. Just an absolutely wild one. Uh, gonna at the top here, of course. Uh, do some housekeeping. Talk about some of our good friends here. Start with our good friends at Charlie Hustle. Charlie Hustle. Dot com on the World Wide Web makers of incredibly comfortable vintage collegiate apparel, Houston Cougar jackets, Houston Cougar quarter zips, Houston Cougar tees, Houston Cougar hoodies. Absolutely, you know one of the one of the best designs out there, and just why I think is really cool uh, through this sports season of uh, you know being partners with Charlie Hustle is just it's not like we're hawking the same unchanged collection. Like they've they've made key additions to the collection. They've solicited our feedback on it, which I think is. Is really cool. I'm not gonna be like I was the great. I was the grand idea behind this Charlie Hustle design. I was not, but the fact that they genuinely seem to care what you know our our feedback was on it, and I think you know had some really awesome timely releases. Did uh, the cool stuff with the alumni association uh, during the Big Twelve tournament in Kansas City. So really cool and uh, growing partnership we have with them. So support our friends, get some good apparel, CharlieHustle.com, and of course during uh, March Madness, the month of madness, and support our friends. By downloading Autograph on the Android and Apple stores, uh, use our promo code uh, SHPOD, uh, auto- Autograph with plenty of uh, cool March Madness stuff. You could win a suite uh, to see the action this weekend up in Dallas. I know a lot of you are going. If you want to upgrade your seats for just an absolute steal, fraction of the price, true fan pricing over there at Autograph, please, if you uh, haven't done so already, join the many of y'all out there we know who have downloaded Autograph on your phones. Guys, Bobby has now joined us as internet is at least temporarily being cooperative uh, right now. Uh, Bobby, why don't you take us into some uh, Cougar basketball talk? I'll give you a chance to do what uh, kind of lead us into this topic by giving you a chance to do what your internet did not allow us to do uh, about a minute ago. How did you personally make it through the quite literally three hour experience that was Buddy, uh, I, that Cougar basketball. I, I kind of have an idea because we texted some during the game and I, I confessed while you were getting back on that I had told you I can't watch this uh, in a closing stage. I did watch it, but I really physically felt like I couldn't. Uh, how did you how did you deal with it and just kind of take us into this topic if you don't mind? 
man, I knew I was getting stressed out because uh, I literally was like, well, I need to take off my Charlie Hustle sweatshirt right here. Like this is, it's been good luck all year. Like it has one loss and that's the Iowa state game. So like I try to wear it, even though it's like starting to warm up a little bit, but I was like, I am physically hot right now. Like I cannot, I cannot deal with this. And my wife's a Houston Cougar and you know, she was watching the game a little bit, but she was like, I'm going to bed. She had a long day. Um, we actually had a really long day. We drove back from Houston um, on, on Sunday and we were up at like 5 AM to get her back to work in time. And so, um, you know, we left Houston at like 6 AM. So we were up early. So she went to bed and I was like, you're not going to be able to go to sleep. Our bedroom is like right off our living room. And I was like, yeah, you're not, you might as well just go turn on your iPad and just kind of relax. Um, and then, um, yeah, it was just kind of, kind of that. And then the she heard, heard a lot it. of you being like, Oh God. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think the big one she heard the most was, uh, how the, do you call that a jump ball? That's not a jump ball. That's not a f-ing jump ball. Um, I think that was probably the loudest I got. Um, and then, and then she heard a lot of, Oh God, Ryan, just one, just give us one of two. I just need one from you here, Ryan. We just need one from you here. So, uh, there was a lot of that, but you know, before we go too deep dive on that game, there was a game on Friday. Uh, let's, let's do a quick review of that, uh, of the Longwood game. Um, just real quick Cougs led by 27 at the half. Um, that was the largest margin that the Cougs have ever won a game by, um, the 40 point. Uh, win is the largest margin in UH NCAA tournament history. Um, and just kind of remember this program has had some pretty legendary teams. Um, so to do something, if, if a team in U of H basketball is doing something that's never been done in UH history, uh, that's something that's pretty insane. Um, last week, Sam and I, we didn't want to get too confident in UH's chances in this game. We tried to we tried to say uh, we should win this game, but you know we kind of tried to talk up uh, Longwood a little bit and not look too far ahead. Um, tried to tried to take the athlete way of nope, uh, let's just beat Longwood, let's just get through this game. Um, but at the end of the day, we didn't really see it being particularly close. Um, I don't think either one of us. I don't want to speak for Sam one hundred percent, but I don't think either one of us necessarily saw a forty point win. Uh, but we are happy about it. Coog shot 58.5% from the field. And if you're holding a team to 34% and you're shooting almost 59%, uh, it's probably going to resi- result in a dub. Overall, dominating performance by the Cougs. Um, what were some of y'all's takeaways? Yeah, I mean, I think the main thing in, in a game like that is you just want an undramatic game. And that's what you got. You know, anytime it's a 116 or just a real high seed versus a real low seed, you don't want the Lancers to start to believe. You don't want every non U of H partisan in the crowd to suddenly get really into it and get cheer, start cheering against you. Um, you know, as a fan at home, you don't want to read the damn tweets from everyone around the country just like laughing at you. Oh, is Houston going to lose? Um, but yeah, this one was 43 16 at the half. That was a. Uh, that was well and truly over before we got to uh, the 20 minute mark for sure. Love getting 17 from Damian Dunn off the bench. His first, I believe his first NCAA tournament game at all, right? Because yep. Temple had never, yep. had never been. Um, and then obviously getting Ramon Walker back um, from injury, you know, getting the news kind of early in the day, he might be available. And then actually seeing him out there playing 13 minutes in this one um, was, uh, was really, really, really good for good for the soul to see Ramon back out there and just good for Houston's depth uh, going <laughs> forward. And I mean, you got Ryan Elvin, six minutes of, of playing time that you didn't have to give to one of your other tired regulars. Uh, you got Ryan Elvin, five points. And, you know, I, I, you know, not to like get ahead, but I think one of the reasons why you want an undramatic game is you can get a bunch of playing time for Ramon Walker. You can get a bunch of playing time for Ryan Elvin in case, I don't know, one of or both of those guys might end up playing a key role in a future game in the NCAA tournament per chance. Who knows? Um, but yeah, just all in all, again, you, you're not, you can only, uh, take so much from, from winning the one sixteen game, which despite a couple of recent upsets is what almost always happens. Um, but you know, you, you got everything that you uh, could have possibly asked for out of this one. It was evident after about five minutes of this one, that one of these teams was the polling and metrics national number one for a good chunk of the season. And one of these teams went six and 10 in the big South, uh, not to say that the Lancers didn't deserve to be there. As I, as I repeated, like if you, if you beat the conference's best regular season by a wide margin, I think, I think that gives you a, a lot of merit to, you know, punch your ticket along with obviously winning their conference uh, tournament. Really the only point where, and I had to kind of look back on this one where Longwood had 
I don't know, even a glimmer of hope of it, you know, maybe putting their foot in the door and staying back in this game is they, they cut the lead to 17 to nine, just inside of 10 minutes in the first half, but Cougs out scored the Lancers 26 to seven to close the half. And maybe even calling that moment, a glimmer of hope might be a stretch. Like you both have said, so, so, so cool to see Ramon Walker back out there, giving you a good amount of minutes off the bench. Like you just said, Dustin, and it cer- certainly didn't hurt. It was foreshadowing that uh, you didn't, you got to basically rest everyone the maximum amount of time. Guys, especially you needed Jamal Shedd and uh, J1 Roberts for a lot of minutes in the in the next round. Also, really like what you saw from Damian Dunn, obviously, in his first NCAA tournament game, and Malik Wilson, I, I think. Both you know both those guys giving you extended minutes and, and getting their confidence in a good place, because that's with your bench being as short as it is and with games hopefully to go after this weekend, you want those guys in a high-confidence state. And, uh, and I think, yeah, really long, the Longwood win just checked every box and and like I think you both have kind of said just not having a stressful 116 game I don't think we knew how stressful the round of 32 game was going to be but I mean we knew Nebraska and them were both we're both good teams playing good basketball at this point in time you knew they were gonna you knew it wasn't gonna be a 40 point Longwood uh kind of thing and, and you know it's kind of a reflective of the fact that this U of H team did did like it had been so long guys since we played a outside the Ken Palm top hundred team. That's the thing about big 12 play is just even the, even the like off weeks, you're still probably playing an NIT caliber team. Like you're mm-hmm. UCF and K state, not the best opponents. UCF and K state drastically better than most of the teams you saw in conference play at most of the last decade plus of Cougar basketball. Yeah. J- just like as a reminder. Oh yeah. This team is just mercilessly good against, uh, against the level of team that like Longwood and most of your 15, 16 seats are. So Yeah. Glad we don't have that much to talk about with the Longwood game. I think that's that's a that's a sign of uh of a of a good game in this case. A sign of uh the expected happening if you're a Cougar fan. Yeah, and the game gave me one of the best tweets I've ever seen in my life. Uh, I sent this one to Sam. Um, a guy who has no profile picture says a effing dude who has made four field goals the entire effing season makes two in the last seconds, including a three pointer to destroy a effing under bet FCBB betting. It's such BS. The effort should not have been shooting a three point shot with a 40 point lead F uh, Ryan Elvin. Is... As if I could love Ryan Elvin more. <laughs> it's such a good tweet. Uh, just just fantastic i saw it and i had tears streaming down my face it's so good just to get that mad over your under bet um yeah longwood game really nice to not have that dramatic uh 16-1 game but uh two days later the kooks played in one of the more exciting games we played this season versus an a and n team that the kooks did see earlier in the season and had a close contest with then. Um, I think going into this game, it kind of had the feeling of the hardest second round matchup for a number one seed. Um, I texted Sam Friday while I was driving to Houston for for a wedding that uh, that this A&M team actually looked kind of scary. Um, the Cougs led by five at the half, and that honestly felt like about what it should be. Um, the Cougs definitely should have been leading going into the half, and five felt about right. Uh, the Cougs were winning, but it didn't feel dominant. At halftime, though, it really felt like a one-point win was all I wanted. It was just, I know it's March, and you always just want one-point wins, but, you know, against Longwood, if you have a one-point win, feels a lot different than this game would have. It, it felt like a uh, felt a little bit like a dogfight. So um, I didn't want to win this game by any margin after halftime. I just wanted to win. I didn't care what it looked like. I really felt like it was going to be a dogfight, and it was, right? This game was a dogfight, physical game but the conversation around the game from kook fans um and i've seen some a&m fans is the absolutely terrible officiating it's not often you see the winning team complaining about the refs but man this was brutal uh the kooks were out attempted on free throws 45 to 30 um which honestly feels narrower than it felt in the in the moment and i think some of that is late game free throws uh things like that uh still a huge margin um, I'll also throw out that 75 free throws is way too many in a game, no matter what. Um, if you if you're sending people to the line for 75 free throws, it's too much of a of a ref show. And this was a classic version of a uh, of a ref show. And I will stand by the fact that the jump ball awarded with 1.2 seconds left in the game is one of the worst calls I've ever seen in a basketball game. Just how do you even 
I tweeted on the first jump ball. How do you call a jump ball when the other team doesn't have their hand on the ball? This was not even close to that. Somehow it made that look like, oh, maybe that should have been a jump ball. Um, that I mean, being like said, he was trying to foul. Guys, didn't he? Yeah. Didn't it look like to you he was trying to get the immediate foul. So Absolutely. U of H would be going to the other end to shoot. Absolutely. And here's I, I will give AM their credit hitting that shot. Um, absolute clutch move. Um, and you do have to tip your hat. That's a uh, good inbound play there. Um, I mean, Cooks had it defended pretty well. You, you made them choose their probably third option on that play if you watch it. Uh, unfortunately, that third option was wide open and, and hit the shot. Sometimes that happens. Um, but before I get too much into my thoughts and start going too crazy on it, that was kind of some of the high level I had was the officiating was just terrible in this game. It was a physical game. Um, but what do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, you hate to start talking about, again, a round of 32 and still determined game that you won by talking you about. Front load it. Because that, because believe me, yeah, front load let's it. Get it out, let's get it out of the way. That's what we're doing. We're getting it out of the way. We're popping this, this, this. We can move on to other things. Um, no, it was rough. Uh, Houston became, as you probably have seen by now, the first team since 1987 to win an NCAA tournament game after fouling out four players. Um, and, you know, I, I'm going to go ahead say, go ahead and say as a uh, disclaimer up front, not every bad call in this game benefited Texas A&M. Not every mm-hmm. foul, not every foul oh, yeah. call is a bad one. And yes, the refs even genuinely missed some actual foul calls that they did not call in this game because it was a very physical game where an above average number of fouls were committed regardless of who was officiating the game. Um, but there were just so many unnecessary whistles. To pretend like that 52 fouls in 45 minutes wasn't inflated by the Zebras being overzealous, I think would be disingenuous. Um, to pretend that the refs calling three fouls on Javier Francis in the first half, the second and the third of which were absolute dog doo-doo. Um, to pretend like that didn't have a massive impact on the course of the game, I think would be similarly disingenuous. The three critical free throws that Wade Taylor shot with 55 seconds left in regulation after he just blatantly pushed off LJ Cryer and then mm-hmm. prior to stay get called get got called for his fifth foul in the shot right after that. Uh, just terrible missed call. The game does not even sniff over time if they if they get that call right. Um, you mentioned the tie up. I went I went and re- went and rewatched it. Wade Taylor on that shot shoots the shot and then just flagrantly like flails his left arm and leg out and draws contact with Jamal Shedd. A play that is absolutely they're like making an emphasis this year to like call that a foul, an offensive foul when the guy does that to like just the most. And again, I don't I understand you don't want to call that at the end of regulation, but it was the most flagrant intentional like version of that you will see all year just flagrantly. Th- and I mean, that's the situation where you're going to do that. So why have that rule if in the situation when you know a player is going to do that and you want to you want to make them not get away with it? Like that's a clear foul and mm-hmm. clearly not a, a jump ball. One of two jump balls in that game that was just clearly not a jump ball that just AM did not have possession of yet. Yeah, simultaneous possession means both teams have to have possession and AM never had possession. Um and then just, I mean, finally, Shed's fifth foul in overtime. If you watch literally consecutive plays, Jamal Shed hits a little jumper in the lane to make it five with, you know, however long to go. You could call it a foul. a and player has a hand on his hip and kind of pushes him a little bit as he goes up for the shot. No foul. On the other end, Wade Taylor the fourth goes up for a shot. Jamal Shed has his hand on his hip a little bit and maybe bumps him a little bit as he's shooting. They call it on, on Jamal Shed to, to foul him out. And it's just like... Yeah, it was it was insane. And again, you know, there was the the out of bounds call, the out of bounds where the A and M guy mm-hmm. had, had to steal a breakaway. Like that was a big momentum shifter. So again, not every call went in Houston's favor. Um, but man, it did feel like a little bit of karma or the ball don't lie or the basketball gods, whatever you want to call it, that A and M missed so many damn free throws in this game. Like we just saw so many just awful calls that they wouldn't go to the line and miss one or both free throws. And you go, okay, well, I don't love that they're trying to foul out our entire team, but at least they're not just like racking up points on, on free throws after this. So um, yeah, lot to like from this game um, from the Cougar side, as long as we're talking about other things other than just like praising how unbelievably resilient Houston was and the win that they got in this one credit to a They kept fighting. They made Houston earn every inch of this. I thought it was over when Houston was up 12 with under two minutes to go. Yep. And it was Same. having none of that, you know, it's not their fault that the calls were whatever they are. They didn't like some of the calls too. So whatever it is, I mean, just, they fought their absolute ass off. Um, and just did, you know, other than make free throws, did about everything you could possibly do. They rebounded over half their misses. Nobody rebounds over half their own misses against Houston. So, I mean, they just, they absolutely played, played out of their minds in a lot of ways that didn't involve uh, making free throws, um, but just made it incredibly tough for the Cougars. And and like I said, ready to kind of, I'm sure Sam will have his, his go with the reps here, but, you know, as for myself, ready to start talking about all the, the good, because there's just so freaking much to be uh, impressed with Houston after this one. 
I'll close the circle on this and get into the basketball if you guys uh, find that agreeable. Perfect. Let's go. This game was actually part of a strong finish, I think, in terms of exciting games on both the men's and women's tournament, the Sunday evening slate, Dustin. I'm sure you were more than peripherally aware that Stanford, Iowa State was going on at roughly the same time. Frustrating finish, but obviously a classic of a basketball game. Yeah, like a credit to the women's game. I think this one, classic wild basketball game. But, you know, and again, for the neutral fan, they probably had a fantastic time watching U of H and m And, you know, UHAM fans probably uh, had to be picked off the floor uh, in some state of either elation or depression. Like, it, it was a wild game. It was it was the game that I think, or kind of game that makes March Madness, I, I think, really the premier sporting event that this country offers, both pro and collegiate. I think for the people that oversee the sport of college basketball in a leadership or over, oversight role, this game should be an embarrassment. Uh, critiquing officiating, I think, can go in you know, really weird and I, I think incorrect places. And to that end, I, I, you know, none of us are saying that or even implying that Jeb Hartness, Marcus Pettigrew or Lee Castle had any desired influence this game towards Texas, Texas A&M. I think it's silly to even kind of go down those roads. That's not what's happening here. Mm-hmm. And this was a physical game between two teams that like to play a really physical brand of basketball. But like you guys have both said, 52 fouls and 75 combined free throws. That's embarrassing. Even taking into consideration that they're was some late game deliberate fouling mixed in there. It was a crew that felt that their presence to this game was more important than the players playing basketball. The kind of mentality that stems from having someone like Jeb Hartness as the most senior official on the crew. If that's not a familiar name to you, Hartness was contracted to a number of big 12 conference games this season, including a number of U of H games was notably part of the crew that ran off head coach Scott drew in an early February game on a second technical that, and it pains me to give Baylor any kind of just like, positive or this was this was an injustice done to them but random on a second te- technical that was just incredibly fl- flimsy so much that it became a major college basketball story for that part of the season how is someone like that allowed to officiate these kinds of games or for that matter to briefly go away from this game tony padilla who was he was the ref at the center of kelvin sampson's ire during that oklahoma state game like kelvin sampson got the maddest I've ever seen him in 10 years here at an official at Tony Padilla, a guy with this reputation is just like, yeah, this guy's a prick. Yeah. This guy like lets his emotions get too much into the game and calls it really, you know, really based on how he's feeling at that moment. How is Tony Padilla getting the Kansas Samford game and allowed to make a call that swung that game? How is Tony Padilla and all three of the fucking officials in this crew? How are they calling sweet 16 games this coming weekend? Like it, it just tells you, it tells you where the heads are, the people in, in an oversight role, because they're not they're not embarrassed by this. They probably think the crew did a good job. And I, I think any anyone who watched this game would tell you the opposite. I think it just tells you how removed those people are from understanding why people like the sport, why people like basketball. I think in some ways it was a very exciting game, but I think we were also kind of robbed of seeing it was basically like AM AM's game was reduced to a you know, free throw parade, which <laughs> kind of to the Cougs benefit because AM has not been a good free throw shooting team and kind of demonstrated that in the basketball. So it's, it's I think it's, it's very frustrating. This game was a classic game, but I still think it would have been better served, better served with uh, I think less stringent officiating. Like I, I think, yeah, I think we've kind of made our thoughts on it pretty clear and we'll talk about the good stuff, the basketball, or at least the, the stuff that uh, we enjoy talking about a bit more, even if some of it was a bit stressful in real time. I think the last time I had to think about this one a bit, guys, the last time I was that stressed in a U of H NCAA game, I think was the Oregon state game uh, in the elite eight in the 21 tournament, Uh, you know, like the losses since then Villanova and Miami, I wouldn't say those were stressed as much as kind of like grim realization, like in the Villanova game, grim realization that we are just cannot buy a bucket today. And uh, grim realization, in the Miami game that we cannot stop our opponent from getting uh, a bucket today, but not really stress per se. And I think, if you want to talk about individuals, I think you got to start with Emmanuel Sharp and uh, his performance in this one, I would say in the absolute pantheon of superb Cougar postseason performances, I'd put it up against what I would say is the gold standard of it. That Rob Gray 39 point game in that first round win in 2018 against San Diego state, where he put the team on his back in that one. I wouldn't say that was, this wasn't as singular of an effort because a lot of other Cougars, I think, I mean, as we'll talk about, it was very much a team effort to get this win across the finish line with your only five available players. But I mean, in isolation, I mean, a 30 point performance where you hit half your shots is great. Full stop. I mean, that, that performance I think gets magnified when it ends up being such a tight finish. I mean, it's an extreme example, but I think this game is proof positive that sharps, the most improved player on your roster. Like you have a lot of improved players. Like that's the great thing about this program is 
basically just about every guy who plays a fair amount improves so consistently year on year. But going from, I would say he was probably the least sure with Francis, you know, starter when we kind of looked at what our starting five would be going to the season from that to dropping a, you know, dropping 30 points in a round of 32 game. Like that's, that's such a transformation. It's so exciting to think about. I don't want to get ahead of this season, but you probably have two more seasons of this guy in your program. He's made such a big jump from redshirt freshman season to redshirt sophomore season. I, I think that's, that's kind of where I want to start it because Emmanuel Sharp's performance stuff of legends. And and you don't, you don't get this win without Emmanuel Sharp having one of his very best, if not his very best game as a collegiate. Yeah. Uh, I mean, just was, was hitting shots all day long, but especially, you know, in the first half when it seemed like, you know, no one for Houston, especially from the outside could, could buy a bucket, you know, they stayed in the game because Emmanuel Sharp kept hitting, kept hitting big three after big three and really kept doing so throughout, uh, throughout regulation and overtime as well. So it doesn't mean absolute pantheon, but I mean, just one of just a number of guys who are just absolute performances are going to be talking about for years uh, in this one. And, and some of the, the obvious ones, you know, I guess we'll go, we'll talk about guys like, you know, Jamal Shedd and LJ Cryer who obviously had big games as well, but you know, just even guys like Ramon Walker coming in, making multiple key plays in overtime, uh, including the massive like rebounded putback that he had mm-hmm. um, that when Houston just desperately needed it, you know, I tweeted it, but I mean, it's, if, if he doesn't absolutely work his ass off to get back, you know, from that injury after it looked like his season was going to be over Houston's season is done right now because Houston doesn't win that game without, without Ramon Walker coming in and, and making plays in overtime. Um, so just, I mean, for him to, to, to go through all that and to get the uh, you know, the payoff for Ryan Alvin coming in and hitting Houston's most important free throw of the season, uh, to push it to four at the end of overtime, you know, it just, and it was just, it made this one as, as stressful as this win was, man, I just, I enjoyed seeing all the players in the aftermath, the players and the coaches and how, and just how emotional they were uh, after this one. You saw Ramon Walker, you saw said lot in tears afterwards. You saw Dunn extremely emotional, you know, on the verge of tears, if not in tears. If you've seen the video of Kellen Sampson going down the, the hallway to the locker room afterwards, you know, he was fired up. Um, you know, head coach Sampson after the game called it, may, oh, he said maybe the most satisfying win he's ever been a part of. It clearly shows that this team did not take getting to the Sweet 16 for granted, even though everybody on this roster, that's all they've known as Cougars is, is going to the Sweet 16 at least every year. But they did not take that for granted. And also, honestly, I think that's, for me, that's the, the overall thing. That's why this team is still is still dancing because there was no sense of we've beaten this team already. We should be able to beat them again. We always go to the Sweet 16. We'll go again. This Cougar team took nothing for granted. They knew that they were going to have to leave absolutely everything out there, every single one of them on the court. And that's what they did. And that's why they got this win by the absolute narrowest of margins in a game where, like I said, AM grabbed over 50% of their own misses. Uh, your Houston was only plus one in turnovers in this one. Uh, and oh, yeah. T- do we mention you fouled out four of your starters, two of whom missed the entire overtime period, another of whom missed over 70% of the overtime period. You had over half of the guys you'd like to have out there miss over half of overtime and 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 won. That's just that's un- an unbelievably great performance, just an unbelievably pieced together performance just from the first guy on, you know, from all all uh, you know, I guess what 10 guys that ended up going out there and uh, and playing at least some minutes. Uh, and that one, all 10 contributions were absolutely desperately needed to uh, to get that win. And and I think we'll be talking about basically everyone on this team and, and the way that they pulled through uh, on, on Sunday night for, for years and years. Yeah, for me, I can talk about the performances, like you said, of Emmanuel Sharp, LJ Cryer, Jamal Shedd, um, the whole team just uh, really putting putting everything together. Um, but I kind of want to talk about the absolute brilliant coaching um, that we saw in this game. Uh, coaches know when to pull certain cards and you heard the team talk about Reggie Cheney and how um, coach Sampson said, what would, what would Reggie do here? And I would imagine that that wouldn't be his favorite thing to deploy um, because I, I know for a fact, you know, no one's told me, but I know for a fact that coach Sampson would have, rather have Reggie Cheney at the game watching this team. Uh, but to know your players well enough to to have that, know that it would be something that they could lean on. And then when you saw AM hit the three, AM celebrated like that was a game winning three. And you saw some Cougar players get kind of disappointed, right? You saw Wani 
kind of pull his jersey up over his eyes. Um, but you saw Samson just basically go, all right, let's go back to work. Let's go to work here. And when one team is riding on that emotional high and it kind of gets, oh, check this out. We just basically won this game. I mean, you saw Wade Taylor run out on the court and then you saw him trying to calm everybody down two minutes later going like, hold on, hold on. We still, we still have five minutes to play. Um, that is just a level of coaching that just can't be described very well. Like to know your team and the emotional state they're in to know that you can lean on certain things that you can um, pull the right levers is huge. And coach Samson teams follow their leader and his calmness after a and hit that three was all right, let's go to work. And you saw the kooks come out and just go to work. Uh, final, final kind of basketball thing I wanted to touch on. Wade Taylor getting 21 seems like it's a, uh, a you know, pretty good game by Wade Taylor. He was number two on their, uh, on their team in scoring, but that first half isn't what that first half is without just an absolute shutdown and defensive clinic on uh, on Wade Taylor going into uh, going into halftime. So just kind of wanted to point that out before we went anywhere else. The coaching job that Coach Jameson did was just incredible to be able to pull the right levers, to be able to twist the right knobs and and pull that team through it. And you saw the emotion come out. That's a coach who knows his team like the back of his hand and knows exactly what to do. And then I just wanted to touch on that defensive performance against Wade Taylor. Yeah. I was going to say a, uh, I think really, really huge moment in this game uh, that really impacted the outcome was Kelvin Sampson calming down his team at the end of regulation. And then the first Houston possession being that one where the, it was the, the miss on the, the rebound, J1 Roberts just absolutely throwing himself into a table to like save the ball to Jamal Shedd, who swings it to uh, to Emmanuel Sharp for a three. And all of a sudden, Houston's got a three point lead right out of the gate to start off overtime. And all of a sudden, that just, I felt like that that stopped so mm-hmm. much of AM's momentum in, in its tracks because all of a sudden, in a very, very short period, you've got a three possession lead. Um, and all of a sudden, so I thought that was that was a huge moment by Wani, huge moment by, by, by Coach Sampson and by, you know, Jamal and Emmanuel Sharp to uh, to make that three pointer happen as well. Side note, just on that, uh, I don't know if you guys remember the commentators were like, he looked like he might have been mute, out of bounds. I muted, I, like, I muted them uh, five minutes into the first half. I did not hear then, a thing afterwards. Maybe to my I detriment, that, but maybe to my benefit. And I heard that, and I was, and then I was like, was he? Because, you know, that's kind of a hard thing for the TV camera to see. And then they show the replay, and he's a foot from out of bounds. It's like, <laughs> what are you guys looking at? Yeah. Uh, I was I was just gonna say, kind of to add on to what what you said, Bobby. Like I really thought, and I mean, I'm not in the arena, so I can't see how your axillary play. But I thought, considering how aggravating, I'm sure the officiating can can be. I thought Samson. I, I don't think you ever saw a guy who lost as cool. Like, mm-hmm. and teams really do like they feed on the momentum of their of their coaches, their head coach and the assistant coaches, and whoever is on the bench there. They feed off that energy, and as much as I'm sure it was very frustrating to deal with the fact that. It was just a constant, uh, just rotating cast of guys that are just like on the brink of being in such bad foul trouble. They're either are not allowed to play in the game anymore because of the rules or like one foul away from being unavailable. I, I thought, I thought you did a good job. I think managing it emotionally. And yeah, like th- that one, the play that Dustin mentioned specifically where you go up three immediately, it felt like U of H landing the first punch. And it also just, it really did look like, and again, you can only tell so much from watching on TV. Like all of us did, like the majority of y'all, I'm sure listening did, but it didn't look like a team that, it, you know, I mean, obviously like probably you know, the immediate reaction, they, these guys wouldn't be human if they weren't just like a little dejected in the immediate aftermath of AM hitting that shot at the uh, end of the second half, but it didn't look like a team that had blown a 12 point league. So you see a lot of times, even really well coached teams, they have just a hangover from, I mean, just like the emotional letdown of being like looking like you're on the verge of doing what this team has done so many times this year and just kind of strangling the life out of an opponent proverbially in the second half to, oh man, like through, through a combination of your opponent, like you said, Dustin playing their ass off and not giving up. And again, no knock on A&M here. Like it's not A&M's fault. This crew Mm -hmm. over whistle, they took advantage of, they did what you're supposed to do. Like if the, if the crew just really is loving is really just assuming contact every single time your opponent contests it behooves you to put your opponent in that situation over and over again opponent with a short bench but you know i, th- I think just to see to see the way the cougs are mentally out there it's not just a testament to samson who i you know he said it many times is a world-class coach I mean, one of the very best to ever do it 
but of the guys that they, you know, identified to come in this program, that these are the kind of guys who are not going to get mentally beat after going through a bad couple minutes at the end. Um, and also, I don't know what you said, Bobby. I mean, 21 points from Wade Taylor, but 5 of 27, I think you'll take, even though he hit some very critical clutch mm-hmm. shots there in the closing stage of the second half to keep a in this. But, I mean, I think you have to look at the the totality of the performance. And, yeah, some a and guys did get theirs. Tyrese Radford had a fantastic game. Andy Garcia, in addition to that, um, you know, big three at the end there, was just absolutely killing the Cougs on the glass at times in this game along with Radford. But to do that to Wade Taylor, I mean, I think that's another uh, another reason why you're talking about this game as a win instead of just a really painful loss. And I mean, I, really looking at this game in a number of ways, I also wanted to highlight uh, Manio, the the job the Cougs did in Manio Besky as well. Uh, he really was somewhat important to AM in these last few weeks. Had gotten a huge amount of credit, I think rightfully so, for him going into that starting lineup and suddenly AM playing dramatically better as a team. Not that he didn't impact Sunday's game positively at times, but I mean, just looking at his game by game, it was Obeski's worst game for shooting percentage in the last month and was one of the key players for the Aggies that the Cougs actually were able to get into foul trouble as well. I think, again, in a game of very tight margins, that was important. But I guess what I was originally going to say, AM was kind of the worst case scenario second round opponent, guys, really looking at this game in the rear view. They saw you once in the regular season when they were playing a lot worse than they are now. And yes, U of H is certainly a more beat up team. I'm not going to relitigate uh our disagreement with uh, one ESPN commentator on that one. But I mean, Tyrese Radford didn't play in that game and ended up being one of their best players on Sunday. That made a big difference. I mean, it's hard to beat any opponent who's fairly good twice in a season, especially when it's one like AM that, you know, was a tournament at large caliber team in a year with a very volatile bubble uh, coming in, playing by far their best basketball of the season. You can even see how they're, specific strengths lined up with the Cougs weaknesses. They were the best offensive rebounding team in the entire country this year. Really good at drawing fouls and getting to the line. They were also one of the best teams in the country at taking care of the basketball. And the Cougs did get some key turnovers. And I think certainly, as we've said many times, the Aggies were helped by an active whistle on a lot of their possessions. But the only opponents this year, I looked at the game by game, who had a lower turnover percentage against the Cougars uh, were the away game at Cincinnati and the uh, the one game you played against OU. Uh, and also, unlike the game or hopefully games that we're going to be talking about this coming weekend, you know, you didn't you didn't have the arena behind you. And, you know, not that U of H can't get into foul trouble in any of the game games after this one. And having nine skip scholarship players is going to work against the best teams out there, including this one. But I will still say this game really did feel like the worst case scenario in terms of having an official you know group with a tight whistle, an opponent with a track record of getting to the free throw line and the team U of H is about to face and we're about to talk about, and even the two teams that U of H you know, could face if you win this uh, tough Sweet 16 game are all very good basketball teams. You are certainly to that point in the tournament where everyone left is a very good basketball team capable of beating U of H like everyone else who's left. I'm totally fine putting my neck out there, guys, and saying that a and matches up with U of H's weak points more acutely than any of the three teams that we're either slated to play or could see over the next weekend. And painful as it was to experience at times, I think it says something that U of H has now survived something that I think in many ways is just the absolute worst case scenario. Guys, literally five, you had five players, not five scholarship players, five players period that had suited up for this game available for you on the court at the end of overtime and still found a way to win like that. That's insane. Like I, I can't believe we're talking about U of H win. Six, right? Because you had, you had lot and, and uh, Ryan Elvin swapping back and forth as Mm -hmm. the, uh, because yeah, you had, you had your eight guys, then you had Ramon Walker, and you had Ryan Elvin. Oh yeah, yeah. So it was technically you know, so I, so I was wrong too because I tweeted during the game that they were they were in danger of running. Sorry, said lot players and ha- and having to run with four. So that was incorrect. But you know, if uh, if uh, if if Wani had picked up one more foul, then yeah, it would they would have they would have been down. Which to the five guys on the floor, and if anyone gets hurt or fouls out, you just play with four. Which let's talk about. Uh, we don't have to dive too deep into this, but Wani playing like twelve minutes with four. Oh yeah, yeah, it's incredible. Needs to be mentioned. Especially yeah. in that game. That needs to be, I mean, that's huge from him there. Yep. Not at yeah. full health, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. And you saw him a little shaky in this game as well. So um, usually if you're hurt a little bit, especially in the in the legs or something like that, you don't move as quick. You start picking up some dumb fouls because you you start reaching a little bit. So uh, like, you, like you said, Sam, absolutely had to be mentioned. But um, with, y'all have any more thoughts on the A&M game? So my, my one last thought from this one is yep, this, hit is, it. this is the ninth straight game 
decided by single digits that Houston has won. Uh, you know, in, in that stretch, you've had the Kansas and the, the conference championship tournament games that got away from Houston. So this isn't an infallible or an unbeatable team, uh, but the ability that they've shown to know how to win games, to know how to win like close games uh, away from home in, in road and neutral site situations in most of those cases, um, just remarkable. And I think never has that been more on display than, than by how they stitched this one together at the end. And that's one way in which, you know, and it's, I mean, Houston a couple of years ago, you know, they won the Rutgers game in the second round in, in kind of a similar, just like real tough, you know, down to the wire fashion. And they, they were still an American Athletic Conference team at this time. But but nonetheless, I still feel like this is one of those games, if you're not in the Big 12, if you're coming out of the American, maybe you don't win this game because maybe you haven't had as many tests on, you know, in, in non-true, you know, in non-home, no, non-home situations that have, you've had games coming down to the wire like that. So um, just, yeah, remarkable, remarkable effort uh, all around, kind of like we've uh, said many times. Absolutely. Well, let's move on to the Sweet 16 and the Duke Blue Devils. How does that sound, fellas? Perfect. Let's do it. All right. This is a Duke team that is a four seed, and they are led by sophomore Kyle Filipowski, who uh, has managed to come back from an absolute possible career-ending injury uh, just a few weeks ago. That knee injury that he sustained a few weeks ago just – Absolutely look like it could end his career. Um, that being said, uh, Filipowski is a really, really good big man, and that has been something that has worried me personally all season from the Cougs. Uh, Kyle's a seven-footer fo- who can pass and shoot. Uh, the Cougs have seen other big men who can pass and shoot, and they have looked both good and bad. I will point to the Kansas games. Um, for that, teams that have uh, good big men, Uh, do give us a little bit of trouble, especially ones that are seven feet. Um, I think a big key to the game, I'm not going to go out on the limb too much here. It's going to be officiating. If we get tight whistles like we did in the A&M game, this game could go a way in which Cougar fans don't want. Um, If the Cougs are sending Duke to the line with any regularity, uh, we could be in a world of trouble. Not that Duke was this amazing free throw shooting team all year, but Um, I think they shoot just a little bit better than A&M from the free throw line. So that's kind of my first thoughts is how are we going to shut down uh, Filipowski? What do you guys see? Yeah, I think he certainly is the guy at the top of the, uh, the scouting report. He's a problem. Uh, Like you said, just extremely talented seven footer, you know, possible if not probable lottery pick in the upcoming NBA draft. Uh, You know, we use Ken Palm to preview every game here. Ken Palm ranks each player. When you look at like the Duke player page, they rank every player. Uh, they, they get a little number next to their to their like ranking. There's 18 different metrics that they can be like top 500 in the country at. Uh, uh, Filipowski ranks in the top 500 in 13 of those 18 categories. That's the, every offensive efficiency, efficiency metric, uh, offensive and defensive rebounding, block rate, assist rate, fouls drawn for 40 minutes and more. Uh, one of the few categories he's not ranked in his three point percentage shooting, and he's he's good at that too. He's a 35 percent shooter. He's a good he's a good three point shooter. Uh, you got to guard him all the way out there. And you got Filipowski in the front court along with six foot nine Mark Mitchell, a double digit scorer himself, who also, like Filipowski, draws a ton of fouls. Um, having both of those guys in that Duke front court when you are so short on front court players and it's so important to keep your front court players out of foul trouble, uh, really, really scary. And then, oh, yeah, even if you uh, slow down their front court guys and stay out of foul trouble, all three of their starting guards score well into double figures or score in double figures at least. And uh, Jeremy Roach, Jared McClain. Uh, Jared McCain and uh, and Tyrese Proctor. McCain, who you may remember, uh, Houston was recruiting really hard. Actually, got him for an on-campus visit uh, before. Unfortunately, he uh, he went to to Duke. So I, mean, I think the one thing that you can say in terms of their their you know overall talent and roster construction is that uh, combo guard Caleb Foster, who was there, who's been their best sub all year, is out for the tournament. Really, really by far their best guard off the bench, which really leaves them without a ton of depth. Um, but it's kind of. <laughs> It's kind of funny for for Duke. It's like they've got enough front court players, but they're pretty low on guards. Houston, kind of the opposite, but both teams kind of dealing with a little bit of a roster crunch. So, I mean, definitely a game that you feel like both teams do a lot of the same things really well in terms of, you know, holding onto the ball, rebounding. It's a really good rebounding team, really good, you know, holding onto the ball team. That's going to make it hard for Houston to win by having a bunch of extra possessions. So, um, you know, I, I think a, a a scary team for sure. Yeah, Filipowski is the top, top guy in the scouting report for – one of the best teams in the country. Everything you guys said, I agree with uh, in basically in the top half of any first round mock draft uh, for this coming, coming summer for any publication out there. Easy to see why true seven footer three level scoring ability plus rebounder on both ends. And 
and somebody who's an advanced enough passer that I think the point forward or point center label, I think is appropriate here. I want to also highlight his kind of running mate in the front court, Mark Mitchell, a very different kind of player, but also a challenging matchup, not an outside shooter like Filipowski, though is at least Compton enough to attempt one of the Cougs. Cougs do like the Dandy Garcia in the closing stages mm-hmm. of uh, Sunday's game and leave him open, but an efficient scorer inside the arc by far Duke's best player at drawing contact and getting to the line. We've both mentioned it as something to watch uh, from this game. Don't need to tell Cougar fans how things can go badly if Mitchell's able to get one or more of the Cougar front court players he goes against in uh, some level of foul trouble. And like you said, Dustin, going to be, uh, I think, tested in the perimeter by a really, really good but not very deep guard group. I mean, Jeremy Roach uh, and Jared McLean are both, both kind of on the opposite ends of the experience spectrum, but both shooting well over 40%. And I think there's been a very good perimeter defense, you know, defensive group, uh, LJ Cryer, Jamal Shedd, and uh, Emmanuel Sharp, chief among them. But you were going to absolutely need to eat your Wheaties against this group. McCain uh, torching James Madison for 30 points last time out. Again, a James Madison team that came into the tournament, one of the very best teams in the country at defending the three and just lit him on fire. Tyrese Proctor, uh, you know, their assist per game and assist rate leader. Uh, making more than a respectable 36.5% of his uh, his deep shots. He mentioned it, Dustin Filipowski, not an elite three-point shooter, but more more than good enough combined with uh, all the other things he demands of you uh, defending him. I- I'm sure John Shire wishes he had Caleb Foster like you talked about, Dustin, but I saw that a, good gr- a very good guard group, if not one that uh, is capable of uh, going super deep. Uh, one of the top three-point shoot- three shooting teams in the country, one of the very best not turning it over, as well, I mean, if you want to contrast a and and Duke a bit, Duke's a good offensive rebounding team, but they're not great or elite. Uh, they're a full 10 plus percent below a and in terms of their offensive rebound percentage for the season. Not that they don't have good offensive rebounders like Mark Mitchell, who just got done talking about, like Kyle Filipowski, who we've just talked about plenty, but they are on that same freakishly good level as A&M, if that makes any sense. I mean, still, the Cougs need to do a much better job at keeping Javier Francis uh, on the floor, not in foul trouble and not, you know, keeping Duke from running wild in the offensive glass like a and did, I think, with some help from the fact that Javier Francis spent nearly all that game in some kind of not super justified, but still existent uh, foul trouble there. Not really, uh, you know, it surprised me that Duke for Filipowski and Mark Mitchell's, I think, you know, genuinely great offensive ability, not that great on the defensive end for all that. And but they also don't have any areas where I think you would say they're bad by any definition, but they're mediocre in a number of areas to be sure, maybe more mediocre than you expect for just the unbelievable talent that Duke can run out on the floor at any given time in any given year. I mean, we're talking relative weaknesses. This is still a team that's inside the national top 20 for defensive efficiency, but it's also a team that's had some clunkers. Like you look at Duke's losses this year and they've had some real defensive clunkers. They have a couple of them, again, I mean, not very good teams like Arkansas and Georgia tech where Duke lost and didn't really show themselves uh, too well defensively, but it's a great strength on strength matchup. I know the I know the premier stri- you know good offense or great offense versus great defense matchup is Illinois Iowa State, but this is a very you know Duke Duke trying to score against this very 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 good Cougar defense. I think I think it's worth the price of admission or the the price of uh, navigating your remote over to the uh, U of H game if you're not going to be there on Friday. Yeah, just. I'm super excited. It's in Dallas um, for personal reasons, let alone uh, going to the game. But yeah, it's I, gonna I was be... gonna say I'm I'm excited that some more U of H fans can try. Like I'm really excited yep. that that I know that there's gonna be a ton of U of H fans at this game. Yeah, and the other fun part, just uh, as a side note, is there's already a lot of events going on, um, and it's kind of I was talking to my wife about this. It's kind of a Cougs take over DFW weekend uh you've age baseball for anyone coming up plays thursday thursday friday saturday they have those games so friday may be a little empty but hopefully with a cougar win if you're staying to go sunday you can also go to the game on saturday so um it should be a really fun uh fun game friday night i think for me it's kind of one of those um it'll be fun game to watch if you're not a cougar or duke fan um it's going to be kind of stressful during that, but it should be like to your point, Sam, a uh, strength on strength kind of matchup. So if uh, Duke can score against this, if this really good Duke de- offense can score against this really good Cougar defense. So um, any other thoughts on Duke, fellas? No, I was going to say, I mean, I think 
genuinely maybe the most similar team that Duke is to a team that Houston has played this year is Kansas, I think, and that it's a team that is better offensively than they are defensively. They've got a, you know, a seven foot big man who can really pass the ball and create a lot of matchup problems. They can just score the ball yeah. like crazy. Um, so I, you know, it's, you know, I think some similarities there and, and, you know, I guess my last thought is hopefully that, uh, the progress that Houston saw, you know, what they went from playing the first time against Kansas to the <laughs> second time against Kansas, you know, maybe, maybe uh, it gives me a little bit of confidence that maybe they'll be able to, you know, play a defensive effort that looks a lot more like the uh, Bertita Center version of the Kansas matchup than the, uh, the Allen Fieldhouse version of the Kansas matchup. Yeah. And, and I think you could, I think you could take a lot from your scouting reports from Kansas, you know, really good scoring big man. And uh, how did, how did you defend them and see that success in, um, in Houston, same. I was just going to say, like, I know it would make Duke fans livid at me to make the, you know, they would be livid at me, which which is fine. I, I would, I don't give a shit what they I was going to say, uh, are they, you concerned? Of, no, uh, but just like the okay. comparison I know will make any Duke fan who happens to tune into this mad. I like that we've seen Hunter Dickinson a couple times. Like, I'm not saying Hunter Dickinson and Kyle Filipowski are the same skill level or anything like that, but like a big man more skilled than your average one with some ability to score on the perimeter outside of 10 feet away from the basket with a big size advantage over you, all of your front court players. Like I like that you've had to see him a couple different times uh, it, you know, in, in very different situations, but I'm glad, I'm glad this team has a couple of different uh, similar ish experience, you know, kind of experiences mm-hmm. with Dickens versus whether you go with Filipowski, Dustin, sorry. I was going to say, in- including the uh, the second time around when said lot got some minutes against yeah. uh, 100. Yeah, big time. Well, yeah. Which is someone who is, yeah, again, unfortunately, more than likely going to have to spend at least some minutes on, uh, on Kyle Filipowski in this one. Yep. All right. Well, if the Cougs manage to beat the Blue Devils, are, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. Any more thoughts on the, uh, on Duke? Go for it. Do that transition. All right. Well, if the Cougs what, do manage. Way away. If the Cougs do manage to beat the Blue Devils, they will be taking on the uh, NC State Wolfpack or Marquette Golden Eagles, if I wrote that down correctly. I don't know why I'm questioning myself if they are the Golden Eagles all of a sudden. Um, NC State has been on an absolute heater leading into the tournament and in this tournament. Uh, ran through the ACC tournament to even make March Madness, I think. I don't think they were nothing I've gone back and kind of read. They weren't a tournament team. And most of the time, if you are an automatic qualifier and you get an 11 seed, you probably weren't going to make the tournament anyway. Sign that uh, 2010 Cougar team. Um, Big man DJ Burns has been getting a ton of attention during this run. Six foot nine, 275 pounds, and just has the ability to move bodies down low. Um, since the ACC tournament started, he's averaging about 15 points a game, and uh, he could be a real problem for the Cougs. Height-wise, maybe he doesn't dominate over Wani, but that is a big man if you have uh, if you've seen him. And then on the other side, Marquette is the two seed, and overall has been a top tier team all season. Cam Jones can really put the ball in the bucket. Him versus this Cougar defense would be a fun matchup to watch. Um, like I said earlier, maybe not fun as a cougar fan but as a basketball fan it may be kind of fun so fellas hit me with your thoughts on the wolf pack and the golden eagles you know as much as u of h fans older than me you're probably extremely wary of seeing an underdog nc state team on a magical run at the lower <laughs> seed in march for obvious reasons uh history still tells us that well more often than not when you see you know a one versus a double digit seed in later rounds in march madness that's usually when the the low seeds especially start start winning out whereas ones versus twos feels like a lot more of a toss-up to me so i'd be happy to play the numbers on that one if i were so lucky as to be offered a a u of h win and a chance to pick between i have a genuine organic disagreement with it but finish your thought i I love it i love when we actually think differently on something so that's that's, that's my thought there but the only other thing that i thought though is that it would feel kind of like destiny for nc state to win one because you could kind of exercise that demon two because there'd be a weird parallel weirdly similar parallel to the 2021 final four cougar team um which beat a, had a dominant win over a small team in the first round had an extremely hard fought and dramatic last second win over a p5 team in the second round uh would then at this point would have theoretically beaten one of the sports true bluest of the blue bloods in the Sweet 16, and then won a uh, elite, elite eight game over a P5 team that had no chance of making the big dance, but won their conference tournament and made it all to all the way to the elite eight. Uh, pretty pretty weird, similar path if Houston were to make it that far and face NC State. So that would be kind of cool. The Houston NC State thing, I'm sure 
uh, you know, the tournament people would love that and would run with that uh, all day. That would be a lot of fun if a little bit, uh, you know, PTSD inducing for some of those older Cougar fans. But, you know, I'm happy to face either Marquette or NC State because if we're doing that, that it means that uh, means we won beating Duke, which is uh, no given by any stretch. Fully agree with that, by the way. That, that is not the portion of uh, that is great. <laughs> and again, everything you said from the broadest sense is is correct. You would rather be facing the 11 seed and what Bobby said at the top. We were kind of, if you were watching the video, nodding in agreement. NC State was absolutely a needed five wins in five days to get in the tournament. Anything less, even considering the good teams they beat to get to the championship game. If they don't beat UNC in the championship game, NIT team like that. That's it. Like just this team. I mean, they had they had some like good wins sprinkled in there, but this was absolutely a needs to win the conference tournament to be in kind of team. And you would again. What Dustin's saying is logical. You would want to face that team generally more often than Tusi, like Marquette, a team that nearly won the Big East without their best player, Tyler Kolek, a, a team that showed themselves to be of incredible quality really from start to finish. Like there wasn't a point in the season. I mean, even last year's UConn team, the eventual champions, had a point where I think they lost three straight Big East games in, in the January of that season. Like they, Marquette didn't have nearly that, you know, kind of lull. Like there was a consistently very good team. But like when you really look at Marquette, and again, I would I would take either team. I just want to be playing in the Elite Eight. But if you look at the Marquette team, they really are like the anti-matter version of Texas A&M. Consistently good all season, which A&M looked incredible against us, and yet somehow lost 14 regular season slash conference tournament games, something I will never truly be able to wrap my head around. But consistently good all season, like I said, great at putting the ball in the basket, and one of the absolute worst teams in the field at getting offensive rebounds and getting to the free throw line. Like that, that that's going to be so important for any matchup hypothetical or real that we have over, you know, hopefully what's another couple weeks of, uh, of basketball. And I, I really do think like, obviously Tyler Kolak, not an easy defensive assignment for Jamal Shed and the Cougar guards. I think that'd be a very good one for the neutrals. Kolak is a high level score. One of the most prolific creators also in the field. Uh, there were some injury questions going into the tournament, but um, he looked excellent in both of uh, Marquette's games. We'll, we'll say one of those was a, I think they were trailing at halftime to Western Kentucky or very close to halftime to Western Kentucky. They eventually did win that relatively comfortably, but was probably the closest of all the uh, 15 to 16 versus one to two seed Kai kind of games in the field and a very close win over. But again, a very talented, very, I think, misseeded in the first four Colorado team, but didn't blow out either of those teams. And again, good team. Like this is not me saying Marquette's not a good team or that I want Marquette or I think U of H would guaranteed beat Marquette, but NC state specifically DJ Burns, who I think the phrase Mack truck, I think is maybe uh, overused to describe players, but I, I think very accurately describes NC state's big man. I think him versus a, I think it's fair to say somewhat depleted in terms of who's healthy Cougar front court. That's a nightmare matchup for me. And just a team that has that kind of cinder. I mean, I don't, I still think you and NC State's flaws will catch up to them before they're, you know, putting down the nets and one shining moments playing. I, I think that team does have an expiration date in this tournament, but I, don't, I just I hate I hate playing a team that has that kind of team of destiny feel. I hate the historic parallel, even though it has nothing to do with the basketball on the court. I, I just feel like NC State, even though they're a drastically worse team over the regular season than Marquette and are seated much lower, I think how they match up with the Cougars scares me more than uh, how the Golden Eagles match up with the Cougars. You know, I really see your point on that, Sam. And I think, you know, like I said, DJ Burns um, is kind of one of those guys that will scare you. But good veteran guys, too. Also, like DJ Horn, Ben Middlebrooks. Like, yeah. it, it, is a, it is a veteran team. Again, like AM, it's like, okay, how did these guys lose so many games this year? Like, it does seem like they have the ingredients for a good team. Sorry. But that's just that's just it for, for me, right? Yeah. Is we talked about Longwood was six and 10 in the Big South. Like, we're still playing a team that, Law and I mean you mentioned it with uh with Duke they had some sinkers right where the, you just go but then you look at you look at theirs you look at uh you look at NC State's stinkers and their season kind of was a stinker I mean they don't this Virginia Tech loss a Syracuse loss I mean lost to Wake you just kind of go through their their schedule and you go. I mean, there's a lot of stinkers in this one. And so if we're going to say that like, oh, Duke had some stinkers, but their regular season, you know, they had a couple of losses and it kind of, you got to kind of look at the same with NC State and just be like, I mean, yeah, I, 
I guess I could see how it's kind of a difficult matchup for the Cougs and things like that, but they've shown that they aren't great at winning games. Not that I think that the Cougs would go in and dominate them, but if you're telling me I got to play uh, Marquette or I got to play NC State, I kind of want to say see NC State. I I don't care about the historical um, precedences and things like that that have happened. It's it's 2024. It's time to you know maybe exercise the demon. And I think it's a great story, and I think it's one that uh, CBS would absolutely be losing their minds for. But at the same time. I, I want to win games. And I, if you're giving me my choice, I want the team that struggled to finish mid pack in the, in the ACC. So that's just me. You guys got more thoughts on uh NC state of Marquette. I was going to say the only thing I'll say, and again, not to keep drawing the parallels to the 2021, uh, but uh, the team that gave Houston an absolute scared to death, that absolute Sam correctly, you know, mentioned it is the only game that I think in re- recent Cougar basketball memory has been as stressful as the AM game. That Oregon State I mean, Rutgers was too, by and more, more yeah. slightly more recent, but yeah, yeah, yeah but yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, that Oregon State, that Oregon State team lost to number three twenty one ranked Portland uh, in non conference was ten and ten in a very mediocre Pac twelve at the beginning of March was ranked one eleven in Ken Palm and then uh, got hot at the right time and scared the absolute crap out of Houston in the Elite Eight before yeah. and they got that dub. So I mean, frankly, like kind of like I mentioned, not to just bring it full circle to like the best team to play in the Elite Eight is anybody, but whoever you get is by definition a team that made it to top 10 teams and then won three games. Right. So I mean, you're going to get someone really, really good. You're going to get a challenging matchup regardless, but uh, fingers crossed that the Cougars will get the, get the chance to play uh, somebody for the right to uh, advance to the final four. Absolutely. All right. Well, any more basketball thoughts before we move on to some other Cougar sports? I think we're good. All right, Dustin. Well, I'll let you, uh, Jump into the deep end with some uh, swimming oh, and diving. I see what you did there. Cougar swimming Thanks, and diving fellas. wrapped up its season uh, this past week uh, after getting three athletes qualified to NCAA championships. A really good accomplishment after after not getting any uh, last year. Um, but this year uh, we saw junior Henrietta Fongley, who was the lone swimmer to qualify for championships. She was able to compete in the 100 and the 200 yard breaststroke events. And then we got a pair of divers in as well with fifth year senior Chase Ferris and freshman M- Michelle McLeod. Both of them competed in the platform dive. Ferris also qualified for the uh, the three meter springboard. Um, and in terms of the swimmer, Fongley's top performance came in the 100, uh, 100 yard breaststroke where she finished uh, in 14th place overall, very impressive uh, finish there. Time of 58.98 seconds in her, her final round uh, in the B final, which was a new Cougar program record. Uh, and then McLeod was the top finishing diver for the Cougs. She finished in 25th place in the platform dive. Uh, very strong performance for a uh, a true freshman there. Uh, the platform ended up being Ferris's best event also. She finished 34th. In the platform, so I think really, really exciting to see such a strong performance uh, in the platform by uh, by the freshman McLeod there, someone who you got three years of eligibility remaining. Uh, was glad to see uh, Chase Ferris, who's been fantastic for a number of years for the Cougs, now in her uh, fifth year senior season, get to go out on top by competing at NCAA championships and multiple events. And then, like I said, exciting to have Fongley back, who uh, finished as high as she did. Uh, in the 100 uh, yard breaststroke, you know, one of the top, uh, you know, dozen or so athletes in the country in that event. And she still has eligibility back for uh, for next year as well. So uh, excited about what we saw from the Cougs at uh, those swimming and diving NCAA championships. I was just going to say, it feels like just generally the team checked all the boxes you'd want to check this year. Like be the mm-hmm. best team that's not UT that's won the, won the their conference 40 something years in a row. Check. You were second at uh, Big 12 championships qualify both you know both a swimming and diving athlete or athletes for the NCAAs and that's big checks there so yeah it feels feels like a program that like it was such a tough act to follow when this head coach came in here and I feel like she's done masterfully Dustin sorry you had something else I was just gonna say one more check you know continue to show that you're gonna bring in impact freshmen and impact newcomers every year as well check as well as we talked about with uh, with McLeod yep yeah all right Sam you want to uh turn your our attention to track and field I sure do. We got a uh, outdoor season continuing on for the Cougs. We're in action last weekend at Rice's Victor Lopez classic. One of the annual early season outdoor meets that you generally see the Cougs participate in. You ultimately had 17 podium finishes among all athletes competing. And even with some of the bigger names that we've uh, generally talked about this program, not participating. I think you still had a lot of athletes really performing at a high level over a number of 
different events. Uh, I think last time I was on here talking about this program, there were a lot of good notable performances from newcomers, be they freshmen or transfers of some variety. So I'm going to leave with one of those tonight. Uh, freshman Cordell uh, Nwakeji uh, won the men's shot put. Uh, as of this week, has the 14th best throw in the country, the second best from a freshman, which is, is nice, uh, nice performance there uh, from Mr. Cordell. And uh, also Mikel Beck, a Juco transfer, won the men's high jump with a clearance of uh, 2.1 meters, ties him with the uh, teammate Andrea Mita's performance from the opening weekend. Uh, both guys currently in the national top 30. We've talked about uh, you know, a number of various jumps uh, over the years with this program, uh, with high-level athletes in the long jump and the triple jump, obviously an all-time great athlete in Carl Lewis. Uh, you know, long jumper coaching this program, but we haven't, and I know it's a different kind of jump. I know you generally don't group that one, but we haven't talked about the high jump as much, which is an interesting and absolutely crazy event. Uh, I encourage you, you've probably seen it if you're listening in like just a highlight cut of like various Olympic stuff, but I would encourage you to do so. It is just absolutely crazy. I'm, I, I'm also, again, a big sports history dork, like the story of how the Fosbury flop, which is now the the kind of the general way that you do a high jump came to be is a, is pretty fantastic. And uh, if you're into that sort of thing, worth your time as well. But hope we get to do uh, a little bit more talking about the high jump this outdoor season. Also going to mention another newcomer, Juco transfer, Miracle Thompson. I think we talked about her some in indoor season. She won her outdoor debut in the women's 100 hurdles. And uh, a couple of your top performers from indoor season, I think, had fantastic days at Rice. Kellyanne Beckford won the 400 with uh, what is currently the 10th fastest time in the country. And Sydney Townsend won the 400 hurdles with a blistering time of 57.17 seconds. Good for second fastest in the country as we record. And, and stick with the 400 hurdles for a minute. Also on the men's side, Dylan Leacock uh, won the event after this weekend, has the 11th fastest time nationally. As well, I'm going to close with uh, another freshman, Kayla Mouton, who won 200 for her second outdoor uh, event win in as many meets. Uh, not a hot take. I think Mikel Mouton will definitely be one to watch uh, this season and uh, over the course, you know, have hopefully was a, you know, a few years longer uh, competing in Cougar red and white. Uh, did actually want to mention a few of the winners. I said I was going to finish, but uh, Caleb Marlborough won the men's triple jump. Uh, U of H's B relay in the four by one uh, actually won to kick off uh, the meets running events and uh, Kevin Grubbs won in the men's discus as well. So a lot of different athletes in a lot of different areas, I think had high level performances and I think notable, that I haven't talked about, uh, I think some of the bigger names uh, to this point that you have so many athletes beyond the handful that you know you, you would think of uh, coming from the indoor season, coming from the previous season, that you have so so many new faces of the program contributing already at high level. I think that's a really positive omen for uh, the rest of the season. Going to mention real quick, also the Cougs will be traveling a few hours west for one of the uh, you know, other big annual early season meets, the Texas Relays in Austin. Always. Like I said, one of the bigger meets of the outdoor season and uh, going to be excited to see what the Cougs do against what is always a high-level competition at that specific meet. Bobby, you want to talk some golf for us? Yeah, are you actually done now? Or are you actually wrapping it up? I know. Or... I was going to say, fall, <laughs> fall start fall start there to keep the, uh, I was going to say, I, I might have jumped the gun a bit to use the, uh, keep keep us uh, two for two on these sports-specific metaphors. But no, I am. I am done and uh, ready to hit the links with you, friend. All right. I just got to give you a little bit of a hard time. Sorry. Got to give me a hard um, time. Got to keep me honest on the show. Um, Cougs traveled to Palm City, Florida for the Valspar Collegiate, and it didn't go well, fellas. Um, Cougs finished 14th at a 16th ahead of Ohio State and Lamar. Uh, Santiago de la Fuente, um, no surprise, led the team um, with – Three pretty good rounds, finished T13, so tied for 13th. Um, the rest of the team, though, didn't do so well. And if you want any idea of how well the other teams performed, the team that won Florida State beat the Cougs by 39 strokes. They had three players shoot lower than Santiago, or de, uh, Santiago, Santiago de la Fuente. They uh, had the winner in two T8s. Um, so just the first round was brutal for the Cougs finished tied for tied for last. Uh, the rounds did get better as they went along, but overall, when you finish 39 strokes off of the leader, um, it usually didn't go well. They finished nine strokes behind their next closest competitor. And, uh, 
beat Ohio State, the team that finished 15th by seven. So kind of out in their own little world, there were some different tiers of uh, where teams qualified and the Cougs were in that bottom one. So not great weekend for the Cougs. Um, And yeah, just you'd like to see a little bit more. It was a stacked tournament, but overall, you still don't want to finish 14th out of 16th. There were um, a couple of a couple of Big 12 teams. I want to say there were four other Big 12 teams, and you finished behind all of them. So um, not a great sign from leading into more of the spring season, and you're getting pretty close to conference, conference season or, or the conference tournament. So uh, not looking great for the men's team. And then the ladies were off this week, and they will be off until two weeks from now. So um, we will preview that next week. And, uh, yeah, wish I could end on a better Cougar golf note. Sorry, fellas. All I knew is that Dale Fuente was in, like, the top individual top 15. I admit I hadn't checked too deep on that. If, yep. I, if, if I had thought about that more, I would have been like, I'll do track last because track's generally <laughs> very, very positive. And Dustin's thing's very positive. We could sandwich the, uh, the lesson. Because, I mean, as, as you can probably tell, the bat and ball sports – went bad yeah, enough I was that g- we that we don't that we frankly didn't want to budget the time to talk about them this week not that they can't get better but they went zero and six yep it but wasn't I great that have, i was i thing. was gonna i was gonna just add it in for those who are curious about the bat and ball sports it wasn't a great weekend zero and six against uh both kansas teams um overall just not a good weekend for the Cougs in terms of uh bat and ball sports yeah the vibes there not so great but we're gonna end on end on good vibes dustin you want to take us home? Yeah, the good vibes we're ending on is, uh, hey, remember how Houston's playing in the uh, the Sweet 16 oh, on, yeah. on Friday for the fifth straight year? Yeah, I mean, then again, just like, I'll just throw a little, I don't think we mentioned it, so let's throw a little nugget out there. But yeah, Gonzaga, some crazy monster. Nine, it's nine, yeah, yeah. yeah. That they've done this. Uh, but Houston, five. Only four other schools have gone twice in a row. So the, the five in a row just, Unbelievable accomplishment. But guys, when we played in the Big 12, we were going to learn. Yeah, I guess uh, it turns out it's just a, a really good program regardless of uh, uh, what it's in, actually. Interesting, interesting. So what you're saying is random Kansas fan on Twitter didn't know what he was talking about? I didn't know what he was talking about. Hmm. Hard to believe that that would be the case. Interesting. But, that but, is yeah. that is interesting, boys. That is very interesting to me. All right, well, this one on a dunk on a random uh, hypothetical Kansas fan on Twitter. Um, I'm all right out, as always. Love hearing from you, the listeners. Uh, we love hearing from you, especially when you leave us a good review on your podcasting app of choice. Uh, we'd appreciate that. That always helps more Cougs find us. Uh, we also appreciate if you have been enjoying this podcast. If you want to uh, put a little money towards the work that we do, you can go to patreon.com slash shpodcast. Uh, that would be very much appreciated as well. Uh, if you want to say hi, you can email us shpodcast at gmail.com. You can tweet at us at shpodcast. You can blue sky at us at podcast. I did a post there today. That's also, I saw that you did a post there. I was Holy gonna, moly. Yeah, well, I'm so proud of you. I appreciate you. We're going to, the two of us, we're going to double handedly make, uh, make blue sky a thing that anyone cares about. Um, we'll make it happen yet. Uh, anyway, if you made it all the way to the end, uh, you're an absolute rock star. And as always, go Cougs.